Good afternoon and welcome to our cardiac and vascular lecture series. I am Dr. Galen Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator in today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephen Hoff, who will be presenting a lecture titled Contemporary Options for Less Invasive Cardiac Surgery. Dr. Hoff is a board-certified cardiothoracic surgeon at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, which is part of Baptist Health, South Florida where he serves as an Associate Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery and Director of Arrhythmia Surgery. Dr. Hoff received his medical training at John Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. He attended uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center at Nashville, Tennessee for an internship and in residency in general surgery, during which he also served as chief resident. He then completed a research fellowship at cardiac surgery or cardiac surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, followed by residency in cardiac and thoracic surgery, where he once again served as a chief resident. Prior to joining Baptist Health in 2022, Dr. Huff was a member of the Orlando Health Heart, Heart and Vascular Institute, chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Orlando Regional Medical Center, and an associate professor of surgery at the University of Central Florida School of Medicine. Previously, he served as an associate professor of clinical cardiac surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Hoff is a national leader in the field of less invasive coronary surgery and heart rhythm surgery, with multiple research trials, presentations, and manuscripts in these areas. Uh, his research has been published in peer-reviewed publications, including the Journal of American College of Cardiology, the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, and the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. He has published, published uh, widely uh, topics that include less invasive and hybrid therapies for coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, as well as minimally invasive mitral valve surgeries. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Cardiology, and the Heart Rhythm Society. He is a member of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, Southern Thoracic Surgery Association, and the Internal International Society of Minimally Invasive Cardiac Surgery, among many others. Uh, please let's give a warm welcome to this very distinguished gentleman. Dr. Stephen Hoff, thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. Dr. Hakim, it's my great pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you today on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk today about uh, contemporary options for less invasive cardiac surgery. These are my disclosures. Um, I'm a consultant and peer trainer for the market leaders in uh, a pro a product development for both arrhythmia surgery and for coronary surgery. And I instruct my peers on how to do the operations that you'll hear a bit about today. So the objective of this talk is to discuss minimally invasive options for the treatment of coronary artery disease, valve disease, and arrhythmias. We're going to discuss emerging technologies in each of these fields and discuss clinical trials um, uh, that Baptist Health is involved in um, currently. Now, this is a list of minimally invasive cardiac surgery procedures that we'll review today. Um, uh, and as you'll hear again, uh, all of these procedures are currently available at Baptist Health South Florida. So we'll talk about several options for minimally invasive coronary artery uh, surgery, including off-pump coronary bypass or OPCAB, minimally invasive direct coronary bypass or mid-cab, multivessel minimally invasive uh, coronary surgery or mixed cabbage, and a hybrid coronary revascularization strategy. We'll also discuss minimally invasive uh, surgery for aortic and mitral valve disease. We'll discuss structural heart uh, options for valve disease, including transcatheter 
aortic valve replacement or TAVR, transcatheter mitral valve repair using a mitral clip, and transcatheter mitral valve replacement utilizing the tendine valve. And finally, we'll talk about another topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that's minimally invasive surgery for arrhythmias. We'll focus on the most common um, arrhythmia, and that is atrial fibrillation. And we'll talk about a couple of treatment platforms um, that involve uh, hybrid approaches with our electrophysiology colleagues. We'll talk briefly about isolated left atrial appendage management and um, uh, emerging technologies in the treatment of inappropriate sinus tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. So we'll begin by talking a little bit about uh, coronary disease and coronary surgery in general and less invasive options um, for that treatment uh, paradigm. Uh, it's long been known that there are multiple deleterious effects that are associated with cardiopulmonary bypass. Using the heart-lung machine to do heart surgery is integral, and that's how we started doing this 60 or 70 years ago. But as I tell patients frequently, the maker didn't intend for all your blood to come out of your body and circulate through a bunch of plastic pipes and filters and then go back in and work right. Um, so there are multiple physiologic effects, um, uh, adverse effects that are associated with cardiopulmonary bypass, including global myocardial ischemia, renal insufficiency, a systemic inflammatory response, impairment of lung function, coagulopathy, fluid retention, stroke, and other neurocognitive deficits. It would therefore make sense that the ability to avoid cardiopulmonary bypass would provide many uh, um, uh, improvements to those situations, including the avoidance of a systemic inflammatory response, um, reduction in length of postoperative ventilator uh, requirements, a reduction in complication rates, and a resultant reduction in resource utilization and post-op length of stay, as well as decreased mortality. Um, specifically, um, it would make sense, and it has been documented for 20 years or more, um, that um, by avoiding cardiopulmonary bypass, we can reduce the incidence of stroke, respiratory insufficiency, renal insufficiency, perioperative myocardial infarction, transfusion, reoperation for bleeding, and perioperative atrial fibrillation. So the ability to do surgical revascularization, coronary bypass, without the heart-lung machine, um, as in OPCAB, allows us the opportunity to provide complete coronary vascularization for these patients in a mode that um, results in less physiologic impact and has been shown to lead to lower mortality, fewer complication rates, including less bleeding, lower transfusion rates, and fewer renal, pulmonary, and neurologic complications, therefore allowing our patients shorter recovery times. The way I describe this to patients and the benefits uh, that this sort of approach provides is in patients who are high risk, let's say prohibitive risk for having coronary surgery because of age or multiple comorbidities, the ability to do this without the heart-lung machine allows them to be operable, albeit at increased risk. For patients who are at high risk for surgery, that risk can be lowered with an off-pump approach. And in patient, patients who are at low risk for having coronary surgery, that risk can be made even lower. I'd like to take that a step further by offering the possibility of not only doing bypass surgery without the heart-lung machine, but now also doing it in a sternal sparing um, uh, method. So it is possible for us to do coronary vascularization through a, a small thoracotomy incision um, with uh, instrumentation that's been developed, we can harvest left internal mammary artery, we, known to be the uh, most effective conduit for surgical coronary revascularization. Um, uh, these tools, if you will, um, provide superior visualization um, and allow um, a safe uh, harvest under direct vision with standard instrumentation. Um, and uh, uh, and Training leads to um, you know, reliable and reproducible experience with this sort of a technique. It also then allows us to um, uh, 
so that left internal mammary artery to the left anterior descending coronary artery, um, uh, either in a standard hand sewn or theoretically in a facilitated way um, through this small incision using standard techniques and standard instrumentation. In addition, this technique can be used for single vessel revascularization that I've just described or for multi-vessel revascularization. Um, my uh, boss, Dr. Joe McGinn, um, is famous for developing this multi-vessel um, uh, surgical revascularization strategy. Another utilization for this sort of technique um, was popularized uh, in the era of the development of drug eluting stents. Um, when drug eluting stents were developed, the uh, recurrence rate and the um, success rate was so much better than uh, back in the bare metal stent day that multiple studies began to show comparable results with saphenous vein grafts placed at the time of conventional surgical revascularization. And keep in mind, the standard of care that we're talking about for surgical revascularization is a transsternal on-pump coronary bypass operation. In 2021, in the United States, 91% of bypass surgery was done that way. So these techniques that we're talking about are um, less common, certainly, but I think, as, you'll, as you can see, offer significant advantages to patients. So with the development of drug eluting stents, we now have the ability to work with our interventional colleagues to develop a what we call a hybrid coronary revascularization strategy, combining a left internal mammary artery graft to the left anterior descending, as I've just described to you, with a minimally invasive, off-pump, sternal sparing approach, with or without a completion arteriogram, and then adding percutaneous intervention with drug eluting stents to non-LED territories. This best of both worlds therapy combines the durability of bypass surgery to that critical LED territory with the minimal invasiveness of percutaneous intervention. We were involved in a randomized trial of hybrid coronary vascularization versus percutaneous uh, intervention for multivessel and left main coronary disease was sponsored by the NIH, recently terminated because of funding issues. But um, again, these are cutting edge technologies that are available now and here. So I'd like to move on to the next topic, which is minimally invasive valve surgery. And we'll talk a little bit about um, our approaches to minimally invasive mitral surgery, aortic valve surgery, and structural heart options for patients um, who um, may be at high risk, say, for conventional surgery. And keep in mind, the conventional surgery that we're talking about is, again, transsternal on-pump mitral valve, aortic valve repair or replacement. So the technique that I'm going to describe to you is a small right thoracotomy, and we'll, I'll show you the differences between a mitral approach and an aortic valve approach. Um, for both of these procedures, they can be formed either with direct or femoral cannulation for cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, they provide uh, excellent direct visualization with very minor modifications in techniques and instrumentation, minimal physiologic impact to patients, and this same reduced morbidity mortality that we talked about with a less invasive approach to coronary surgery. Dr. Hoff, so, let me ahead. interrupt you just a second. I am so sorry, uh, but just for the sake of of our viewers, uh, is there a possibility that you can actually put it in a presenter view? Um, yeah, I thought I was in the presenter view. Let's see. So it's uh, under display settings, switch to presenter view. Is that better? Uh, now it is. Thank you so much, and I apologize. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, so this is our approach to the uh, middle invasive mitral valve repair or replacement through a small right thoracotomy incision. And uh, through this incision, we can do pretty much any procedure that we could. Um, and in fact, I tell patients, interestingly enough, with this approach to this incision, we can actually see the entire mitral valve uh, annulus and apparatus better than we can see it through a sternotomy incision, um, which is really quite remarkable. And there have been some instrumentation um, uh, modifications that you can see here for retraction and visualization. 
but it allows the surgeon to have a direct view of the entire, entire mitral valve annulus. And actually, um, uh, in some cases, um, uh, a, a more complete view of the, uh, of the field. We can form a number of procedures with this approach, including mitral valve repair or replacement, tricuspid valve repair or replacement, atrial septal defect repair, left atrial myxoma resection, and uh, surgical uh, ablation for uh, atrial fibrillation. Similarly, uh, through a small right anterior thoracotomy, we can approach the aortic valve in the same way to uh, perform uh, aortic valve replacement, um, aortic valve repair, or um, uh, root procedures as the surgeon's um, experience dictates. I'll move on then to structural heart procedures. Now, some of these procedures are extremely common and uh, may be uh, performed uh, in your hospitals now. Um, we'll talk about transcatheter valve replacement or TAVR, which is uh, extremely well penetrated throughout the world. Uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair with a mitral clip device and transcatheter mitral valve replacement using the tendine valve, uh, which is currently under trial. So TAVR has been around for two decades now, which is really quite amazing. First in man uh, implantation of a balloon uh, expandable uh, uh, Aortic valve, transcatheter aortic valve was done in 2002 um, for the self expanding valve, 2004, and the partner trials um, allowed um, uh, FDA approval of these devices in the United States um, a few years later. Um, these approaches are um, usually done in a hybrid operating room. Um, uh, and in most centers done in conjunction uh, together with cardiac surgeons and interventional cardiologists, they can be formed under general anesthesia, though more commonly these days we do this under conscious sedation. Um, uh, our echocardiography guide could be TEE or transthoracic echo, depending again on our anesthesia strategy. And access in general can be accomplished transfemorally with a recent downsizing in these devices and their delivery platforms. Though alternative access options, including transsubclavian, transcarotid, and um, less commonly direct aortic or apic, transapical uh, options all exist. With regard to transcatheter mitral valve repair, again, this is a catheter-based procedure, basically, that simulates an uh, established mitral valve repair technique called the Alfiori repair, uh, which was popularized several decades ago. Um, but what this has done is basically allowed this to be a catheter procedure. This is a transvenous approach, transseptal, and this um, stapler device, if you will, um, uh, will allow um, uh, connection between the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets as depicted in, um, in D here, uh, that basically turns um, an oval mitral valve annulus into a figure of eight annulus. Um, and um, again, to patient, depending on patient selection, we could do this without significantly causing stenosis of the valve, but uh, dramatically reduce insufficiency. So this has now become a really commonplace repair, transcatheter repair for mitral regurgitation. The final technique we'll talk about is a transcatheter, transapical mitral valve replacement. This is a, uh, uh, a field that's been under study for many years. This is a takeoff of that uh, TAVR technology um, and the um, desire to um, be able to perform a catheter-based valve replacement in the mitral position. The difference between the two is the aortic valve um, is under um, different stresses and, and has um, different fixation options uh, that the mitral valve lacks. And so being able to find a stable fixed platform um, for the mitral valve has been an order of magnitude more difficult. This is probably the most common device that's available. It's currently in clinical trial and currently, you know, clinically available at our institution um, called the Tendine valve, which is a, um, a catheter-based valve that's placed through a small left thoracotomy through the apex of the heart into the mitral valve annulus and then deployed. And I think what you'll see is the 
uh, as the next few years go on, is there'll be more and more um, experience and ultimately likely um, uh, uh, EMARC and FDA approval for one or more of these devices in this space. Uh, again, continuing to offer mo more options for less invasive cardiac surgery. Now, the last major group of um, things that I like to talk about is hybrid and minimal invasive therapies for arrhythmias, and in particular, atrial fibrillation. We're going to talk about a couple of different approaches to hybrid ablation for atrial fibrillation. Uh, again, the benchmark for this procedure is the Cox Maze procedure. That's an operation that was developed by uh, Dr. Cox beginning in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and interestingly, uh, he and his electrophysiology colleagues came up with effective strategies for this probably 15 years or more before Dr. Hassegger in Paris was the first to actually describe um, what was really going on that got patients into atrial fibrillation and kept them there, um, uh, which I think is a remarkable feat. But again, the baseline for this is an operation that gets done through a sternotomy on the heart-lung machine and is associated with the real risk of complications or death. So when I talk to patients about this, I tell them, you know, that operation was exceedingly effective, but just not very popular because of those things. And so over the last 10 or 15 years, we've begun to develop and now make more standardized um, uh, hybrid and minimally invasive strategies that accomplish the same thing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that over the next few slides. So this hybrid ablation technology that I'm going to talk to you about, we believe is another one of those best of both worlds technologies. We know that the surgical lesions that we can create for this on a beating heart on the surface of the heart are robust. We believe that managing the left atrial appendage to lower or eliminate stroke risk for atrial fibrillation is key. And rigorous epicardial testing with follow-up endocardial testing or ablation from our electrophysiology colleagues ensures that we can provide full thickness and complete uh, lines of ablation that Dr. Cox initially um, uh, was able to perform during his open heart procedure, but we can now do it much less invasively. We know that there are certain um, scars that are created in the original Cox Maze procedure that are difficult or impossible for us to do on the surface of the heart, but our endo, uh, but endovascularly, endocardially, our EP colleagues can do this with remarkable guidance. And we believe this is the ideal approach for patients with what I call complex, symptomatic, persistent, or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. These diagrams will tell you a little bit about how we do this sort of procedure. It's done thoracoscopically, so through uh, port incisions, as you see right here, usually three port incisions. Um, with the devices that have been developed, we can create a very robust uh, area of um, scar around the pulmonary veins, which Dr. Hassegger showed us are the key to isolating the heart from those um, uh, those triggers that get someone in atrial fibrillation. Then after that, we have a unipolar linear device that allows us to create the rest of the lines of ablation that Dr. Cox told us were necessary to keep people from staying in atrial fibrillation. Again, we believe that closing off the left atrial appendage and eliminating it from the bloodstream is vitally important in uh, not only the electrophysiology of a maze procedure, but also the thing that patients are most interested in, and that is the dramatic reduction or elimination of their stroke risk from any residual atrial fibrillation. This is an electroanatomic map that our EP colleagues uh, can perform, which uh, shows a little bit about the effectiveness of this sort of a procedure. So in this situation, um, the areas in red are areas that no longer can conduct electricity. And what you see here basically is that all the areas along the posterior left atrial wall that we know are associated with perpetuation of atrial fibrillation can't conduct electricity anymore except one little spot there in that green and blue area. And that's a gap in that line of ablation. And so what our electrophysiology colleagues can do, having created this map, is ha they have a GPS-guided catheter that can find that spot and ablate it. 
And those little tennis balls that I call them are the areas that the map has created that show where they've ablated the, um, uh, the um, gap in our ablation line and now created a complete um, uh, electrically incompetent area that can't produce these abnormal electrical cycles that give people an atrial fibrillation. So the next slide is a diagram of what we've really performed. That is, these the red lines are areas of scar around both sets of pulmonary veins. We've connected those um, uh, lines of ablation with lines above and below that um, provide um, a complete interruption of those abnormal electrical cycles that perpetuate atrial fibrillation, including that little red ball at the top in the middle of that one. That's an example of a, a, a touch-up procedure. Um, Dr. Cox showed us that uh, another line to the left atrial appendage, where you can see that clip that we put on there, um, is another part of the maze procedure. The uh, little um, uh, red balls of ablation on the, are on the mitral and tricuspid annuli that are, again, an important part of the maze procedure, and right-sided lines um, uh, as needed. So this, according to Jim Cox, is a Cox maze lesion set done with a much less invasive approach and a combination um, uh, in conjunction with our electrophysiologists. And this has been shown to be exceedingly effective um, in uh, treating, cu curing people of atrial fibrillation. Now, there are several large groups of patients who are a bit underserved by this particular procedure because they just can't tolerate it particularly patients who have poor pulmonary function, may be very obese, have poor left ventricular function, or at least moderate resultant mitral regurgitation. And in that situation, we have another option for them to create that area of posterior left atrial wall ablation. And this is a different approach that, um, which is again done on the beating heart without the heart lung machine through a little incision underneath the breastbone, where we can put a scope in, and this slide shows you in the lower right there, the view, a cartoon of the view that we get along the back wall of the heart and with a specially designed device that's allow, that allows us to perform ablation, we can prevent, uh, prevent all that area from conducting electricity and therefore um, uh, begin to treat their atrial fibrillation. And this, is, this provides one portion of that maze procedure and the rest is then done by our cardiology colleagues. Now, there are some pluses and minuses. Obviously, this procedure, we believe, is much lower impact in the patients, creates a very robust posterior left atrial wall ablation, um, and may be available to more patients. But because of the nature of the lesion set, um, is probably it is, has been shown to be, uh, the results are slightly inferior to that thoracoscopic ablation. And unless we add a left thoracoscopy to manage left atrial appendage, can't stand alone. So some pluses and minuses, but lots of arrows in our quiver. I'll talk there very briefly about some other emerging, emerging technologies. Um, we have the ability in patients, say, who just can't tolerate or we don't think are going to be successfully uh, undergo surgical ablation, the ability to just manage their left atrial appendage. So usually with that atrial clip device, it's usually in a patient population that's can't be managed in an endovascular -like way, like with the Watchman device, that sort of thing. And there are emerging technologies now for hybrid ablation strategies for ventricular tachycardia and inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And we'll talk about some clinical trials re regarding those as well. And finally, the uh, ability to um, uh, provide complex lead management for patients um, who may have uh, complicated situations. There's certainly a growing need for lead management um, and laser-assisted lead extraction is by far the safest and least invasive way that we've been able to do this. Most commonly, we can um, extract leads that are either infected, causing chronic pain, um, are dysfunctional, or have been recalled with this laser device um, uh, with a complication rate that's dramatically lower than it has been in the past. Um, however, there are some patients uh, who may have um, can't um, aren't uh, candidates for that sort of an approach because they may have bulky thrombus or vegetations on leads, um, and we can pre perform what we call a hybrid uh, lead extraction strategy, where we can perform standard lead extraction down to the level of their heart, and then perform that 
right minimally invasive right thoracotomy approach to remove the intraatrial and intraventricular portions of their leads under direct vision. For the last minute or so, I'll talk a little bit about some of the hybrid clinical trials that um, uh, we're working on here at Baptist Health. The first is a trial of that thoracoscopic ablation procedure that I talked with you about to establish the safety uh, and effectiveness of this combined hybrid approach, thoracoscopic and endovascular. These are both procedures that are FDA approved, but this is basically to um, begin to uh, show long-term um, efficacy for the treatment. And um, that's a trial that's currently ongoing. Um, in a trial that we hope to have running by the end of 22 or beginning of 23, we'll evaluate the safety and effectiveness of this hybrid uh, ablation strategy with a sinus node sparing approach to the ablation of inappropriate sinus tachycardia, a highly symptomatic and um, uh, problematic and largely underdiagnosed um, uh, arrhythmia uh, in patients that we can talk about later if uh, people have questions. And finally, there's a post-market um, uh, study that we're looking at for the convergent procedure, that sub-sternal uh, approach that I talked with the, uh, about, um, to look at um, best case scenarios for patients. So to conclude then, um, minimally invasive and hybrid approaches have become really quite commonplace, and in many situations, as we've discussed, have become the standard of care for these um, uh, cardiac um, uh, patients. Baptist Health offers a broad range of these state-of-the-art procedures. They have been shown to be safe and effective alternatives in the treatment of coronary disease, valve disease, and arrhythmias. We believe an integrated multidisciplinary approach provides optimal evidence-based care for our patients and Baptist Health is involved in international clinical trials, as we've talked about, in the fields of hybrid therapy as well. So that's really all I wanted to talk about today that I think gives you a 30,000 foot view of a number of treatment strategies. And um, I would be uh, happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoff. Uh, that is quite an impressive uh, presentation simply because you have put uh, in context the incredibly large amount of uh, new technologies and procedures uh, that you have in your armamentarium at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. It is worth mentioning that uh, you have joined uh, the Miami Cardiovascular Institute at a very good point uh, in uh, the life of this particular institution. Uh, with uh, individuals and peers uh, that have come from all kinds of walks of life with incredible, incredible technology already proven efficacious in the treatment of those conditions that you have described today. Um, again, it is uh, uh, an amazing uh, type of uh, way of approaching cardiovascular disease in comparison to 10 years ago or 15 years ago where uh, patients will go into um, uh, the OR theater and then uh, this major procedure is performed on them and then the length of stay in the hospital and the complications and, and the ramifications that came with it. Now we see a complete shift in the way you guys are doing cardiovascular uh, disease uh, treatments, uh, especially in your field and areas. Uh, obviously, to all the students uh, present today, one of the biggest and most mind-boggling thing is how does a cardiothoracic surgeon determine which procedure is best for either an arrhythmia, uh, you know, doing something minimally invasive versus an ablation, or how in the heck does a thoracic surgeon determine that a minimally invasive incision can actually work for a cabbage, for instance. I mean, this is something that uh, it is uh, science fiction to uh, the lay person, obviously, and, uh, and more so uh, for physicians that uh, have not been exposed to this technology. So uh, it, it is uh, perhaps one of the most exciting things for us. Now, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Dr. Hoff, it was uh, in regards to, obviously you mentioned clinical trials briefly, uh, talked about the clinical trials, and, and this is something that uh, it is also dear to everybody's heart, especially in the Southern Cone, Central America, in the Caribbean, especially because we want to move patients through the continuum 
in securing that uh, there is an adequate treatment perhaps that could assist these patients. So uh, the first question is, how do we actually uh, identify cases that uh, would serve the purpose and cases that could be a potential candidates for those clinical trials? Yeah, I think that um, you know, that's basically a matter of education. As you described, um, a, a, it's a little bit of a secret for a lot of these um, procedures that this is available. I mean, the TAVR that we talked about is a commonplace uh, procedure that gets done at a lot of hospitals around the world. Um, but to talk about the less invasive strategies for coronary surgery, a little bit more common, but then the less invasive strategies for arrhythmias and that sort of thing, that's, it, it's just not really well known. And so um, I think it's um, opportunities like this to be able to um, provide that sort of um, uh, education and information for healthcare providers. Um, you know, we, we even see patients who, you know, in the um, in the era of Google and YouTube, um, begin, you know, have a diagnosis and begin to seek alternative options, potentially less complicated options for their disease process. So um, those uh, paradigms have changed for physicians in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that uh, in putting this together was really, really was quite remarkable that, you know, this is where we are mm -hmm. in 2022 um, for the treatment of these common cardiac diseases. Um, it's not just about your father's heart surgery anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and even uh, for um, congestive heart failure, the yeah. things that we're doing for congestive, uh, congestive heart failure and uh, in, in regards to uh, the type of devices that we're using, et cetera. I mean, that, that is unheard of and continues to be unheard of in some communities uh, abroad. Uh, so the, the, uh, one of the uh, biggest conundrums that we have is perhaps uh, when we encounter a referral from abroad where a patient is already coming at a very late stage in the disease progression, uh, you know, cardiovascularly. And, uh, and then um, obviously, how do we determine that uh, that patient is an actual candidate for a treatment here? And also, how do we clarify not only to the caregiver, but to the referring provider that because of the stage in which the patient is in, uh, the length of stay or perhaps complications may be completely different from what we have already known to be a minimally tight stay in the hospital. Right. I, I think that um, each one of those disease processes is a bit different. Um, you know, if you have coronary disease, obviously one of the most common things that we deal with, um, you know, then I think it's a matter of um, having all these options in your quiver, whether this is an uh, off-pump bypass operation, whether it's a a minimally invasive, um, you know, a mid cab or mixed cabbage or a hybrid revascularization strategy, all those theoretically have pluses and minuses. And so, so whether that's um, the ability of a patient to tolerate a less invasive incision, um, the disease processes that they may have that would make them a better candidate for a um, less uh, impactful surgery than for standard approaches. Um, uh, in the case of um, uh, AFib surgery, we mentioned, you know, this thoracoscopic approach and that sort of thing. Well, uh, for instance, uh, from a candidacy standpoint, we want to be sure that AFib is the only thing they have wrong with their heart. So there are screening process that we go through to be sure that their lungs are healthy enough to be able to tolerate that thoracoscopic procedure. They don't have any other problems with their heart, like blockages or valve disease, uh, those sorts of things. So there are uh, some tests that we can do to make sure that that's the right procedure for any particular patient. Mm -hmm. We have uh, several questions uh, posted. Um, Dr. Salas is asking, are international patients able to opt for clinical trials? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ha. Yeah, we're working through that strategy. Um, you know, the ability to offer this for our international colleagues is a really important um, uh, uh, directive for us. 
Um, and, you know, now uh, I tell patients, um, you know, the, maybe the one good thing that came out of COVID is the ability to screen patients um, with a video visit through Zoom. And so um, we have the opportunity to speak with a physician or a patient about their particular situation, whether they may be candidates for these sorts of procedures. So I think that streamlines things a lot um, and, and will allow us to, you know, be able to honestly, um, uh, you know, potentially offer this um, across a broad spectrum. So I might uh, be able to help with this, uh, Dr. Hoff, as well. And the answer is, uh, yes, we do encourage international patients to participate in clinical trials. Uh, it goes through the international department. We're able to actually gather the information required by Dr. Hoff and his team. It goes through the trial team, uh, clinical trials team, to understand if the patient is already qualified, it's already qualified, uh, for the specific trial, and then that Zoom call that Dr. Hoff is alluding to ensues, and obviously conversations with the attending locally, and then we plan that patient to come over. Uh, part of the clinical trial is covered for, by uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies, if it is medications, or the uh, uh, if it is a device or some sort, it's covered by that laboratory. And then everything else, uh, imaging and laboratories, is on the actual patient. And obviously, the length of stay in the in Miami. And, is good. and the one thing that I would add to that is in the surgical trials that we talked about, um, follow up is important. And so we're working through some of that with our um, industry partners, who are often sponsors of these trials, to be able to provide that sort of follow up, whether it be by Zoom or whatever. Um, to um, allow them to participate in those clinical trials. That's exactly right. Thank you, Dr. Hoff, for the clarification. Um, uh, Campbell is asking, uh, Jermaine Campbell is asking, I'm taking some medications from, uh, I believe, mitral prolapse condition, loprosor and low-dose aspirin. I'm noticing blood pressure is lowering a lot. I suppose to take I was supposed to take 12.5 milligrams twice a day, but I'm taking 12.5 only at night before bed. I wake up uh, dehydrated and tired. I guess uh, there's not a follow-up question on that, but uh, she's extremely tired because of the medication she's taking. Yes, side effect of the drug. Yep, yep, it is uh, exactly in, described in the bottle, as a matter of fact. Uh, Anna is asking, are all these hybrid approaches uh, approved by insurance companies that you know of, Dr. Hoff? The vast majority are. There are a couple of these procedures and a couple of insurance companies that still consider these procedures experimental. Um, and haven't covered them, although that number is dwindling every year. And so, uh, you know, that's also an important thing to for us to look into. And, you know, we have options uh, that we can often bring to bear as well. But um, but the vast majority of them, yes, are covered by insurance. That's correct. And and then and also to add to that, Dr. Hoff, uh, some of these conditions obviously are coded in the insurance world in a, in a lump, uh, you know, similar to what we do with ERGs or CPTs, et cetera. Uh, so what we actually have done is use a global code that will encompass this particular procedures, regardless if they have been approved or not by the FDA. If it is considered experimental and it will suffice and it will improve the, uh, the, the patient's uh, quality of life, we will bill it as that particular grouping of diagnoses. So it's similar to what happened to robotic surgery at the time when we started using the Da Vinci versus uh, laparoscopic surgery. We use that general code in order for us to bill uh, and get paid that lump sum instead of going through the motions until it got approved. So a uh, great question. Uh, Yvonne Marchand, is there any condition who want is there any condition who won't benefit from this type of procedure? I think I mentioned it earlier as far as candidacy is concerned. Um, you know, uh, there are, depending on the procedure you're talking about, there are certain um, uh, anatomic or um, comorbidity conditions that may 
preclude the ability to do some of these less invasive procedures for people. Um, but, uh, and again, some of that also depends on the experience of the surgeons. The uh, nice thing about the group of surgeons that we have here at Baptist Health is that they're all very experienced at um, uh, pretty much every one of the procedures that we've talked about today. So um, uh, yes, I think depending on the procedure you're talking about, uh, there can be certain exclusion criteria, if you will, um, for being able to perform the procedure. And that's why we like having all those arrows in our quiver to offer patients. Uh -huh. You've described so many incredibly um, uh, amazing, uh, rather, um, uh, procedures. Are you excited about any upcoming new technologies or procedures that uh, are already, you know, making a buzz in the cardiovascular field? Yeah, the the I think we talked about ventricular tachycardia and inappropriate sinus tachycardia as being sort of new um, innovations. I'll give you an example of the inappropriate sinus tachycardia or IST. It's a disease process that's um, primarily in women, often young women, mm -hmm. and it's very underdiagnosed. What happens to these women is they have an abnormality in their sinus node, lower in their sinus node, that leads them out of the blue sitting on a couch, all of a sudden they'll develop a sinus tachycardia at 160, 180, 200 beats a minute. So much so that often their left ventricle doesn't fill and they pass out. Um, and they're often, they go to their doctor and they're diagnosed, it's a very difficult diagnosis to make. So they're di sometimes they're diagnosed as having psychiatric illnesses or just being nervous or whatever. And when we finally diagnosed these patients in the past, what's happened is attempts at performing catheter ablation to ablate that specific part of the SA node have been associated with two problems. One is the sinus node gets, uh, or the sinus or into the AV node gets ablated completely and they're mm -hmm. pacemaker dependent. Mm -hmm. The second is they can develop phrenic nerve palsy. So bad that now you have a young woman who's pacemaker dependent and can't breathe very well. Now you haven't improved their lives very much. And the problem with pacemaker dependence in young patients is after about 15 or 20 years, they develop a cardiomyopathy and now they're on a transplant list. Mm -hmm. So this procedure has been designed to not only be epicardial endocardial hybrid, but to be sinus node sparing and has been exceedingly effective at treating this without those complications we saw before. So I tell patients every, we've done this now several times in this emergency technology. And I tell everybody that I talked to about it, these women cry twice. They cry in my office when I meet them and they tell me how terrible their lives are. They, they've lost jobs, they've lost relationships. And then they cry again in my office when they come back and they're fixed and they haven't had any more of this. Um, that wow. is, for me, one of those things that helps me get up in the morning and go to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are just so, so fortunate to have you, Dr. Hoff. Thank you so very much for everything that you do for our patients. Uh, we're on the top of the hour. I'm going to let you go because I know you do have a busy day uh, still ahead of you. But I wanted to thank you on behalf of our international uh, team um, for your presentation and, and intervention today. And to all of you for participating for your great questions. If you do have additional questions for Dr. Hoff, please feel free to send them to BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. That is BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We look forward to seeing you at our next cardiac and vascular lecture series, uh, which is scheduled for November 9th, 2022. Thank you once again. Stay safe and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Hoff, once again. My great pleasure.